But this morning, I want to talk about contending for the faith. Um, and our key text will be from the book of Jude, that I'm sure some of us uh, at times forget it exists in the New Testament, uh, because of how short it is, and it's easy to skip through, uh, especially if you're rushing to Revelation. Uh, but Jude is a powerful letter with a lot uh, that we can learn from. And so if you've got your Bible, why don't you turn there? It's only one chapter long. We won't cover everything. We'll mostly focus on the last little bit, but keep, feel free to have it open. Uh, but before we, we look at Jude, uh, I want to talk about a survey uh, that I read uh, online. It's a survey by uh, an organization called uh, Lifeway Research, uh, and they do these uh, two yearly surveys on the state of theology in the U.S. church. Uh, so while it's, it is based in America, I would say it's, I'm sure the results sort of reflect a lot of the Western world. Uh, and I thought it was interesting. Uh, they sort of give out this bunch of statements, and then people have to say whether they agree uh, or disagree with these statements. Uh, and I put out a, a couple of the, of the results there. Uh, 67 percent of, of people, by the way, these are Christians, evangelical Christians, uh, saying God accepts the worship of all religions, including Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. And 53 percent agreed with the statement, Jesus was a great teacher, but he was not God. Uh, 46% believe that the Bible's condemnation of homosexual behavior doesn't apply today. Uh, and 42% believe that sex outside of traditional marriage is not a sin. Now, this is within the Christian church. Right? Uh, it's, it's quite alarming because these are the basic beliefs uh, of true Christian faith. Right? This is not about any denomination. These are part of the fundamentals that we believe, the practices we have and the beliefs that we have. Uh, but it seems like a good portion of evangelical Christians, at the very least, believe heretical ideas and believe in, uh, in sin, really, uh, not being wrong. So if we move to Jude, uh, Jude, as, as the letter suggests, was written by uh, a guy called Jude, who, appeared to, who, who also happened to be Jesus' brother, uh, and Jude was an important figure in, uh, in church history or in the early church. He was a traveling missionary spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, and he writes a letter to uh, a church that has been infiltrated by corrupt teachers. And these teachers are denying Jesus and using God's grace as a way uh, to give license to their sin. Uh, and so he is writing the Christians there to encourage them to contend for the faith. Uh, and so I'll, I'll just... We won't focus on the first part, but I want to read verse 3 and 4 because uh, it gives us the context in which he's writing to, or at least his reason for writing. So he says, Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt compelled to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's holy people. For certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. Now Jude spends the next portion of the letter, if you, if you keep reading in your Bible, highlighting how these teachers are going to face judgment and pointing to examples in the Old Testament and other Jewish writings. Uh, and th these teachers are rejecting Jesus' authority and rebelling against his teaching uh, and leading people away. So Jude warns that these teachers uh, are going to be facing destruction uh, you know, in Judgment Day or sooner. Uh, and so after that, uh, you can read through verse 5 to 19, he comes back to that reason that he wrote about, which is to encourage believers to contend for their faith. And so that's where I want to pick up and we'll spend the rest of our time, which is in verse 20 to 25. Um, so verse 20 then says, But you, dear friends, by building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire. To others, show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. Verse 24, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling 
and to present you glorious before you, to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. So the question for us this morning is how do we contend for the faith? Uh, based on this passage, uh, there's uh, two main sections uh, I'm going to pull out. Uh, and the first one would be how we are to contend by remaining in God's love. And then we'll look at three things that we do uh, as part of remaining in God's love. And then we'll look at how we are called to be merciful. Uh, so that is one way is how we relate to God. The other way is how we relate to other people, uh, as we see in this passage. Uh, and so uh, in this portion, uh, Jude encourages his listeners to remain in God's love. So verse 21, he says, Keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternity. Uh, and there's three things he highlights there. By building yourselves up in the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, uh, and implicit in verse 21 is uh, waiting. Uh, and we'll talk a, a little bit about that. Uh, and so the first one, building yourself up uh, in your most holy faith. Uh, to build ourselves up in the most holy faith uh, is to have good and robust doctrine and theology. Uh, the phrase, your most holy faith, is used to talk about the faith that was passed down from Jesus by, through our apostles, uh, and that is what has formed the Christian faith. Right? Uh, and so that faith is recorded in Scripture, uh, and it's the foundation for our life as Christians. Right? And so whilst we have a personal relationship with Jesus, uh, that relationship is dependent on what God has revealed to us in Scripture first and foremost. So Scripture is that foundation, and it's the guardrails. It's the objective standard that we have uh, that we hold all personal revelations against. And so everything should come back to his word. Right? A people who are after God's heart ought to be a people who treasure his word. I remember talking to Mormons uh, a few a couple years ago. You know, they stood me as I normally do. Uh, lovely guys. And we had a bit of a discussion. I think we caught, caught up two, three times uh, for about a couple hours. And they, they say, so I asked them one question. Oh, how do you know what you believe is true, all these things that you're saying, how do you know they're true? Uh, and they shared with me that, oh, they had this experience. Uh, they call it a burning in the bosom. And I was like, what is a bosom? I don't, I don't know. Uh, but they use, I think, some feeling that they had, like a fire burning inside them. Uh, and that confirmed to them that they were saved. Uh, of which, I asked, how do you know that experience wasn't just you know, what you ate? Uh, or worse, uh, from the devil, right? Uh, I didn't get a straight answer there. But sometimes we can be in danger of over-specifying or, or over-committing to experiences without the foundation of Scripture. And so all our experiences, I'm not saying experiences are bad, it's good, to have tangible experiences with the Holy Spirit, uh, but it always needs to be grounded in Scripture. Uh, in Acts 2, 42, uh, it says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. So a key aspect of us building ourselves up is being rooted in God's Word. It is by reminding ourselves of God's truth through studying His Word and meditating on it day and night. In Psalms, I'm sure most of you know this verse, Psalm 119, verse 105, your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. And so having good theology and good doctrine is important in building ourselves up in the Lord. It is essential uh, for us to remain in God's love because at the end of the day, how can we claim to love God and be in, love, and be in his love if we do not care about knowing him accurately as he's revealed himself through scripture? But Jude doesn't stop there. He, move, he continues. He says uh, in verse 20, right after that, he says, uh, by building yourselves up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. And the power to build ourselves up in the most holy faith comes from prayer. Right? Prayer is important. Right? And uh, praying in the Holy Spirit uh, 
is praying according to the leading of the Spirit and according to the will of the Spirit, right? according to God's will as is revealed uh, in his word. Uh, and as the Spirit prompts us, uh, we pray for the things that he brings to mind. Uh, and so we need to have a prayerful dependence uh, upon God for everything that we do. Right? In, in 1 John 5, 14, 15, uh, he says, this is the confidence we have in approaching God. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we ask for. So we pray in the power of the Spirit uh, so that we pray accordance to his will. And whatever we ask, he will give us if we pray in accordance to his will. Now prayer is intimate as well, right? So there is a closeness being spoken of here. Uh, we don't pray to God as if he's someone who is far away, in a you know, galaxy far, far away. Uh, we pray knowing that he is near to us, uh, closer than the very breath that we breathe. Right. In Romans 8, 26, I, Paul says, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. In our weakness, we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. 27, and he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. How beautiful is that? As Christians, we pray in the Spirit when we don't know what to pray for, he intercedes on our behalf. Uh, and then in verse 21, we, we, we keep going. Uh, he says, keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. That phrase, as you wait, uh, is highlighting uh, a hopeful expectation. Uh, it's waiting expectantly. Uh, it's not a passive uh, wait. You know, it's speaking of an attitude of a life that uh, is motivated by the promise of Jesus' return. And so as we wait, we are waiting with anticipation. Right? And so earlier, earlier in, the, in, in the letters I mentioned, Jude talks about the judgment that awaits are those who are leading people astray and causing division. But for those of us that are in Christ Jesus, mercy awaits us. And so for the Christian, we look forward to Jesus' promised return. We look forward to Judgment Day uh, as we know that mercy awaits. And that motivates us to stay in the love of God, to hold on to the faith, to contend for the faith. So Jude's letter is to encourage believers to contend for the faith. It's to encourage us to persevere in the midst of chaos and division uh, by keeping ourselves in the love of God. And we just looked at quickly those three ways that we do that. Uh, but then in verse 22 to 23, uh, Jude continues to give those instructions, but he changes direction a little bit. Uh, and now he's focusing more on our relationship with others. How do we contend for the faith in the midst of these false teachers, these people who are teaching these bad things? And this is what he says. Be merciful. Right? Verse 22 to 23. Be merciful to those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire. To others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. I thought that was an interesting response. You would expect, at least naturally, that if someone is coming against the church, your first instinct is to kick them out. Right? You know, show them who's boss. Right. And yet his, his first point is be merciful. Right. He wants us to be merciful to, I think, three groups of people that I will highlight. He wants us to be merciful to the doubter. That's very clear in 22. He wants us to be merciful to those that are lost. And I think he wants us to be merciful to those who are corrupt, those who are actually speaking these falsehoods. And we'll talk a little bit about that, because I know that is challenging for some of us. Right? So in, in uh, being merciful to doubters, other versions sort of say, have mercy on those who are wavering. Uh, this could be those who profess faith in Jesus, uh, but are not firmly grounded in the faith. Right? Sometimes it could be new believers. I don't know if you remember when you were saved. You know, some of you probably uh, could recite the whole Bible from the moment you were saved. Praise the Lord for that. Uh, but there are some people who have some learning to do. Uh, and sometimes new believers are so excited about their newfound faith that they're carried away by every wind 
and wave uh, of teaching and doctrine, uh, sometimes including false ones. Uh, and so uh, it would be unfair of us to then try to judge those people and, and sort of condemn them, but we should be showing mercy to them. Um, or it could be someone who's faced immense hardship in life. Now they're starting to doubt God's goodness because of the circumstances, and their faith is being shaken. We ought to have mercy on such people. Right, we have to be compassionate. We have to be patient. And we have to show them the love of Jesus and care for them. Right, in the context of the people that Jude is writing to, these false teachers were causing confusion, and, and probably many were starting to doubt whether to follow uh, these teachers or not. Uh, and Jude doesn't want such people who are doubting, who are wavering, to be slandered. They should be dealt with uh, in love and mercy. They need to be built up, not torn down. But then he continues in verse 23 and says, Save others by snatching them from the fire. I think we need to be merciful to the lost within the church, right? This was sent to people who were in the church, uh, and it's referring to people who are headed to a life eternally separated from God. They are headed towards hell. Uh, and Jude says, snatch them from the fire uh, because uh, these are the people who have bought into their false teaching. Right? Now, for some people, you will need to be firm with them by speaking the truth in love. That is a merciful thing. Speaking the truth is part of showing mercy. And at times, the truth feels harsh, but we can do it in a loving way. Imagine a child or a blind person who is walking towards a busy road. Right? They might be oblivious as to what's going on, but you can clearly see that if they continue going, they're going to be hit by a car. The loving and merciful thing to do in that situation would be to grab them and pull them out of the road. So in the same way, we, there are some that we need to show mercy by clearly pointing out the error in their beliefs the error in their behaviors, and the error in the teachings of those that they're following, so that they can turn to Jesus. And we do that in a loving manner, in a loving attitude. And then on to the next one. Be merciful to the corrupt. All right, he says, To others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the cor corrupted, uh, even the sta clothing stained by corrupted flesh. Now, this third group, I must admit, is probably tougher to show mercy on because they're the ones actively working against what you're on for. Uh, they are the dangerous heretics, those actively teaching and engaging in false doctrines. Yet we are to show mercy to them. Right? But we have to also be careful in our interactions with them. Uh, and that's what he says here, mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. All right? The warning there is we need to be careful in our interactions with them so that we don't get trapped in their false teaching as well. Right. Um, I sort of think about the idea of saving someone who's drowning. Now, I will admit my swimming skills are just a smidge better than a rock, so <laughs> I'm not probably the best person to talk about saving people who are drowning. But from what I know through observation, uh, <laughs> It is unwise to jump into the water as a first instance when someone is drowning because generally drowning people are going to pull you down with you. And so usually they recommend try get something to them that they can hold on to uh, and getting into the water is sort of the, the last thing uh, that you, you do. Uh, that's because it's easy for them, they're panicking, they can drag you with them. It's sort of, you know, it's not a perfect illustration, but it's sort of the same way when we're dealing with people who, are, who hold to um, erroneous beliefs. I, I spoke about Mormons earlier. I have chatted with Jehovah's Witnesses as well. Uh, they, they, are, they are evangelizing to us, right? To them, we are the lost. Uh, and so we need to be careful in our interactions with them. I'm not saying don't talk to them, but be mindful, be careful. Uh, I think they need the gospel, so we need to... Uh, preach with them, to, to preach to them as well and share with them and witness to them. Uh, and so there is a caution there that is given. Uh, and so there, and there's also a tension, right? You have to show mercy, so be, be, 
be loving, if they're in need, provide for them. Uh, we are to show mercy to them. Uh, yet, we are also to hate every inclination of false doctrine, and division, confusion that is they're bringing into the body. And I think one of the hel- ways to keep this tension, this healthy tension, is discernment. Uh, we need to be discerning. Now, discernment is often seen as a negative thing, uh, or thought of, in a, in a, I guess, in a negative light, in the sense that we think of discernment as being able to spot the wrong things. Right? Oh, that person is doing something wrong, I'm discerning. Uh, that's not necessarily it. Right? We, discernment means we need to be able to discern what is good and true, so we can hold on to it and celebrate it and practice it, but also what is false, so we can stay away from it. Right? If you just focus on, on the false stuff, uh, there's a danger that you just become too critical and you just be fault-finding and not actually doing anything to celebrate, to fill yourself up. Now, I work uh, in, in cyber security, so I work in a, uh, in a bank as part of a cyber team, uh, and I'm sure many of you, if you've received emails, you hate those scam emails or phishing emails that try to steal your, your data. Uh, and I, I get to talk to different people about this. And I, I find it interesting that some people end up saying, oh, you know what, it's too hard, I'll never open an email. That way, I can't click on anything, right? That's a fair strategy. If you don't open an email, you're not going to get scammed through emails, right? If you don't answer your phones, you'll never get scammed through a phone call. Uh, but at least if you, if you work in the corporate world, you probably won't have a job for too long because your bosses will be emailing you and you're not responding. Right? And so you need a different solution. And so we, as part of my job, we help uh, train people to discern between uh, a good email and a bad email so that you can still do your work uh, and not be tried by that. And I think that's sort of the way we need to approach uh, discernment within the body. Uh, we need to be able to recognize good doctrine uh, good practices, celebrate them, implement them, uh, and then uh, put aside uh, the bad stuff. I think that is a mark of maturity, if you ask me. And so we need to develop an ability to discern. Uh, Paul uh, in Philippians 1, verse 9 to 10 says, and this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more uh, in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best it may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ Jesus. And so if you're someone who only descends the negative, my encouragement and challenge to you is to ask the Holy Spirit to help you discern and recognize good teaching, good practices, and celebrate them. Uh, we also need to be able to discern and recognize bad doctrines and practices so we can mercifully snatch others away from it. And in order to be able to do this well, we obviously need a robust theology, like I said. We need a good grasp of doctrine uh, and a prayerful dependence on God and constantly praying in the Holy Spirit. And so discernment in both directions will help us in showing mercy to the doubter, snatching away those who are lost through truth-telling, and exercising mercy with caution when dealing with those that are dangerous. And so up to this point, Jude has been highlighting uh, our role in contending for the faith. Uh, If we stopped here, you'd probably be exhausted and burdened, thinking this is all up to us. Uh, But he sort of highlighted the things that we do, and he concludes the letter, uh, and he shifts gears once more and focuses on what God does for us. And he concludes with worshipping Jesus. And this is the aspect of, uh, of the letter that is key to everything that we've spoken about. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm glad some of the songs that we sang this morning um, highlight this portion as well. Uh, so I'll read 24 and 25 to us again. This is commonly known as Jude's doxology. Uh, it says, To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence, without fault and with great joy, to the only God our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority. Through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now, and forevermore. Amen. Jude wants us to know that whilst we have a part to play, it is not all up to us. 
Jesus is our keeper. He is able to keep us from stumbling. Uh, Jesus is victorious over all spiritual opposition, as we sang uh, this morning. He is victorious over all division, over all chaos, over all confusion, over all winds and waves that try to derail us. Uh, Jesus is victorious over all of that. He is our keeper, and he will never forsake us. He will never leave us. Right? So the primary way we contend for the faith and keep ourselves in God's love is by submitting to and being close to Jesus. Right. So everything that we ought to do, you know, being merciful and, and uh, building ourselves in the, in, in the Lord, Jesus has done perfectly. Right. He had the perfect grasp of scripture and doctrine. Remember when the devil tries to tempt him uh, and challenges him with scripture in the wilderness, Jesus responds back with scripture, correctly applied. Right? When the Pharisees and religious leaders try to trap him, he responds perfectly uh, and they can't catch him out. And he spoke the truth in love. Right? He was merciful. He showed mercy to those who were around him. He was loving. Right? He, was, he lived a perfect life. You know, he was healing people, dining with the sinners and outcasts. Uh, and he showed his mercy for us on that cross. Mm. He was perfect, spotless, and sinless, yet he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crucified with two criminals who deserved it, yet he didn't. Uh, in this ultimate display of mercy, Jesus did not say, Father, give them what they deserve. Instead, when he was hanging on that cross, and people were mocking him, he said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And yet the grave could not hold him. And he defeated death. And as we sang this morning, he is alive. Yeah. And this Jesus is the only God, our Savior. Right? He is glorious. He is majestic. He is beautiful, as we sang. Victorious. He is powerful, and all authority belongs to him. This Jesus is the one who keeps us. He keeps us safe. He is our good shepherd. He protects us from the evil one. He guides us in our path of life. This Jesus is the one who will present us without fault and with great joy. But his righteousness is put up, uh, upon us, and so when we stand up before God on Judgment Day, we don't get the judgment we deserve. We receive mercy instead because Jesus is the one who presents us. So because of all of that and more, he is worthy of our praise. He is worthy of your worship. Not just on a Sunday, but every single day. And he empowers you through his spirit to be able to contend for the faith. He empowers you through his spirit to study the scriptures. He empowers you through his spirit to be merciful to others, even those that we naturally wouldn't want to be merciful to us. So as I finish up, I wonder which area the Holy Spirit is highlighting for you this morning. Could it be that you need to be more careful in your theology and doctrine? So you can know him better? Are you someone who needs to exercise better discernment? Either way? Are you someone who needs to be more merciful towards others? Are you someone who needs to depend on him in prayer more? Why don't we go before our God and Savior in humility? but with confidence, ask for forgiveness, repent, and then ask for his empowerment to do that which he is calling you to do.